Awesome. So then we had the questions while we were out. How sensitive are neural networks to input data? Can we have some data that is completely off and still end up with good results? Um, well, yeah, the, the, every machine learning method is very sensitive to the data. It's probably 90% of the, of the messes I made with machine learning were due to messes in the data. Yeah, then you can, you can add some new, you can add some layer, make it bigger, make it smaller. But in the end, it all worked as it was supposed to be working. And those, in my, in my experience, those were like minor things. In the end, the data was the major cause of uh, pain. If the data is completely off, you shouldn't expect good results. No, they, they, I don't think that would happen. Uh, you can test it in, the, in this notebook, actually. If you increase the size of the, random, of the randomness in the data points, so this is now very small. If we make it of the same order as the, um, as the function itself, this one will not be able to learn this random noise. Okay. It reached the optimization limit and it didn't converge yet. So you can see that you would have to do this uh, fit. You would have to add some extra parameters to make it try even harder. So it, it, it didn't train at all. Of course, it cannot learn randomness. It's, uh, it's a deterministic model, so. Yeah. I had it a few times. There were some bugs and the data was read incorrectly. And then it just didn't learn. What am I doing wrong? Do I have to change the activation function? Do I have to make the, I, I tried all of them, but in the end there was a bug in the data reading function. And uh, yeah, there's nothing we could have done. So yeah, let's keep moving. Um, this page. Okay, the last part of the, of the tutorial is gonna be on regression models. Kernel Ridge Regression. Uh, there is a notebook, there's actually, yeah, there is one, KRR Total Energy. This is similar to the Neural Network Notebook. It works the same way, but it's with this method instead. So, I'm gonna show you the, the, the uh, basics, the mathematical basics of uh, KRR. It's a very simple method. So, uh, we start, by building the kernel matrix. So let's say that you have uh, MI and MJ would be the descriptors of two molecules. You have a database of them, you have a bunch of these M's, and you have a D function, distance, something that measures how similar or dissimilar these two descriptors are from each other. The simplest one would be your, your uh, descriptor is a list of numbers, and your distance function is just the Euclidean norm. That's the simplest one you could craft, right? Just the norm between uh, the, the distance between two vectors. Uh, the, you can build a matrix out of this. So you take every I, every, every molecule I and every molecule J, every pair of molecules from your database, and you can build this uh, kernel function, kernel matrix. You can add this smoothness this is a smoothing factor alpha, which is usually between zero and one. Uh, so that means that the, the diagonal of that kernel matrix would have been zero because molecule one is similar to molecule one. So the distance is zero, it's the same. Uh, but uh, yeah, we just put a small number instead. So we, we are telling the, the method that Molecule one, yeah, it's similar to molecule one, but not exactly the same. We are allowing, we are allowing some uh, wiggle, wiggling room to the fit, right? That's the meaning of, of what that, loosely speaking, of what that parameter is there for. So once we have built the, the matrix, um, we would have to invert it at some point. Uh, before that, we can also build this, uh, uh, other matrix T. So let's say that we have a, a new set of molecules, a T. This is the test set. 
we don't know the energies or the properties of this model. We just have the descriptor. So Ti is the descriptor of test molecule I. We can calculate the distance between uh, the test molecules and the training molecules. We will end up with a new matrix D. Okay. Now for um, the, the, the molecules that uh, we trained on, uh, M's, we know the properties. So this uh, YM is a vector containing, let's say, energies of all the training molecules. We can get the vector of energy, predicted energies for the test molecules applying that formula. Very simple. We invert the kernel matrix and we multiply, we multiply by the um, uh, the distance matrix transposed, the distance between the test and, uh, and training. And then we do the scalar product with the vector of energies of what we know of the training. And that's it. That's very simple. Just two matrix multiplication and one matrix inversion. Done. Let's see it in action. We have the same database now. Again, we have multiple choices. We can choose what, uh, what descriptor we want to use. Let's say the global soap obtained from the mean of the atomic soaps. We load the data. Now we would have to choose how many. Uh, let's not be so eager. Uh, like with neural networks, maybe a thousand samples is enough. So we use a thousand for uh, training, and uh, we will use thousand or whatever is there for uh, validation. Thousand and a thousand. Okay, this is the uh, descriptor for the first five molecules. You see, there's a lot of zeros. Well, that's because probably that that molecule doesn't have fluorine, and uh, these soaps are all concatenated. So. There's uh, H, C, N, O, F. If the molecule doesn't have fluorine, and there's very little fluorine in the database, so the last one is all zeros. But great, now we can build the kernel matrix. We, I, I prepared this uh, small uh, function here. Uh, you can find it in the, in the notebook folder here. There is pi krr. It just applies those, those formulas that you have seen in the notebook. This is uh, creating the matrix for every i and j, and then is uh, calculating the inverse. Very straightforward. So we create a solver. We give it this regularization uh, smoothness parameter. And uh, yeah, now it's building the matrix and inverting it. So, and now we can evaluate on the validation inputs. Not that great. It really doesn't look good. Yep, huge error. So, what do you do in this case? Now you don't have this huge amount of hyperparameters like neural networks. You cannot uh, cannot uh, fight your way away from this. You just have to either blame the descriptor or you blame the distance function you chose. In any case, you have to blame yourself. The problem is always between the screen and the chair. Always. So let's try different descriptors. That's all we can do now. Let's try bag of bonds. This is what they look like. Much better. 
again, we are using a much crappier descriptor. This is just bag of bones. This is like so 90s. It's, it's amazingly 90s. So 20 years ago, people were doing this for cheminformatics. And uh, surprisingly, it works better than soap. No, that's, that's a trick. Um, the distance function we are using may also not be best, the best choice. So what, what could possibly go wrong? So if you think about what's happening is that we are having these uh, molecules and uh, we are evaluating the similarity between them with the distance function. We are taking this uh, huge parameter space of the descriptor, but in the end what tells us uh, how a molecule is similar to another one is just one number. So we take this giant soap descriptor and make the Euclidean norm, the difference between molecule one and molecule two, squish it down to one number. Now, how much information do you have in there? Well, it's just one number. The information comes from the fact that you are having multiple pairs of molecules compared to each other in the kernel matrix. So th there are other ways of defining the, the distance function. You, you can do all sorts of stuff, applying some exponential. In the papers, you, you will find different solutions. Uh, usually, this, uh, this KRR for molecules should have, should have actually worked with SOAP. So, well, we can try again a different one. Anyway, there are exercises here for you to do. And I, this is the last notebook I'm going to present today. So from, from now up to 5.20, you are free to, to try all the exercises you want. Uh, ask me for questions. So again, the, the exercise would be exactly this, compare the descriptors and test different training set size. You, you can quickly tune. And again, try to do the dimensionality reduction, PCA or the other one. And uh, see if you, can, uh, if you can get it to work. I will quickly try myself because so, uh, SOAP is generally good. I'm surprised that uh, this, with this data, I wouldn't give anything nice. So let's try center. Hmm? Which is bad. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, okay, yes. Um, damn it. Uh, you can calculate SOAP with many parameters or, or like with many L shells or with few. You can use a big radial basis or small radial basis. Probably what we did here was try to keep the size of the database small uh, because it's on GitHub and then you have to download it. So probably the SOAP we calculated is not very accurate. It's maybe three or four radial basis function. So it's not encoding the, uh, the atomic environment quite as accurate as bag of bonds. Yeah, this, this one's awful. So anyway, an exercise you could try to do is, um, it's not written there, but you could try to uh, take a database of uh, atomic position, and we have one, In the data folder, you have an XYZ file which contains a lot of structures, structures.xyz in data. Now, this is a kind of uh, XYZ format where the first number here is the number of atoms in the molecule, the second number is the energy in Hartree, and then you will have 26 XYZ at atoms. The first number is uh, the type, nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, and then the positions. If you scroll down at some point, this is the last atom of the first molecule, then the second molecule starts. 11 atoms, this is the energy, and these are the guys. So if you read this file in, in the notebook, you can uh, create these uh, molecules and then feed them through the scribe, and you can get descriptors for them, and you can control yourself how many 
L and N for the SOAP uh, decomposition. So you, you can try to use this database. It, it doesn't have as many, but I think it's still in the thousands. Oh, very, yeah, yeah, there's, there's so many atoms in here. It's probably around uh, 5,000 molecules or so. It's plenty. And again, it's couple cluster. It's the same level of quality. You can take home this database and use it for your own purposes. It's yours. Enjoy it. Colonel died. <laughs> it's a bit weird. Anyway, yeah. Good luck with the exercise. Is it true the quantities that can be used for reaction coordinate or order parameter can be as descriptor? Yeah. Well, I, I'm not sure what you mean by reaction coordinate, but yeah, order parameter. Yeah, of course you can use it as a descriptor. As, uh, so why not? I, I, it's probably not complete. Like bag of bonds, I guess you're you're referring to bag of bonds, but um, it's by no means complete or unique or uh, smooth. It it pretty much breaks all the rules I lay out in the beginning, but it works in the end. It's prob you probably won't be able to run molecular dynamics with a potential using this descriptor. It, it won't work like that. Seems it's doing okay now. <laughs>